The Tom Woods Show, episode 1360. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, by now many of you know that Bob Murphy and I will be engaging in an Oxford-style debate aboard this year's Contra Cruise, the fourth such cruise we've held. And I keep saying that I'm going to crush Bob so badly, people are going to need to carry his corpse off the ship. And that may have been a bit of a downer for some of you. So let me remind you that before Bob perishes miserably, we're going to be playing games, having a lot of laughs, getting to know a lot of wonderful people, and seeing some beautiful sights in Alaska. So yes, Bob's funeral is going to be a bit of a downer, I'll grant you. But overall, it's going to be a fantastic time. Joining us will be special guests Gene Epstein and Brad and Deidre Berzer, all of whom have been guests on The Tom Woods Show. To sign up, go to ContraCruise.com. Reserve your cabin right away at ContraCruise.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. There is a lot of talk these days about wealth redistribution, and I dare say there is more talk about it today than there has been at any time in my lifetime. So this is truly a watershed moment. So I thought I would dig into the archives. I found a talk I gave at the Mises Institute's Mises University summer program in which I talked about wealth redistribution and some of the difficulties and consequences of it, both when we think of it in terms of people within a country having their wealth redistributed from one person to another, but also talking about wealth redistribution from one country to another. So welfare programs and foreign aid, uh, development aid programs, are the topic of this particular talk. Now, tomorrow I got a uh, fun, interesting, controversial guest coming on. You're just going to have to wait, but that one is really, really going to be worth it. This one, as I say, goes back to probably 2010, But the kind of topic that it covers is much, much more relevant today than it was in 2010. So we're going to play this baby for you now, and I hope you enjoy it. This little presentation I I give here was initially called something like American Presidents and Economic Law. I I never really knew where to go with that. And it ended up being a thing on wealth redistribution. So I figured let's just call it what it is. So I'm going to talk about two different aspects of this question. I'm going to talk about various domestic domestic initiatives that have been undertaken with the aim of making income distribution more equal. Now, I hate this phrase, income distribution, about as much as I hate the the phrase, you should give something back to society. He's giving something back. Well, he didn't take anything, right? Why should you have to give something back? If he took something, then give it back. But otherwise... (laughs) So I don't like this idea of income distribution because on the free market, there is no method, there is no mechanism of distribution whatsoever. There are people making exchanges. That's all there is. There's nobody dealing a deck of cards. There's just people making exchanges. So there is no method of of distribution. And so therefore, by the way, by implication, there can't be such a thing as a just distribution or an unjust distribution if there is no distribution. That's a side question. The second thing I'm going to look at is our international efforts to alleviate inequality and help help poorer countries get uh, get rich. And we'll we'll see how these how these things have worked. Now, since you guys are young, well, we got Herbiner in here, youngish. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring if I just keep throwing barbs up, maybe you'll say, I give up. That's it. I'm, I'm leaving. Um, you guys, some of you might actually not have heard of the book I want to mention and focus on a little bit at the beginning here. And that is, a, oh, did I forget to bring it? Oh, for heaven's sake. No, that can't be. Well, I need somebody to do me a favor in the, in the library because I want to actually hold it up as a visual. Um, Look for Charles Murray. So look under M for Murray. And the book is Losing Ground. Oh, good. People are writing this down. You have not heard of this book. Wonderful. Good. So this won't be a total waste of your time. Murray wrote this book called Losing Ground, American Social Policy, 1950 to 1980. And it came out in the mid-1980s. Thank you very much, Matt. Came out in the mid-1980s. And then it came out again in a 10th anniversary edition. Thank you. This is the original edition, Losing Ground came out in a 10th anniversary edition in 1995. Let me see if the uh, the pagination roughly 
corresponds with the old. Um, good, good, it does. All right, good. Okay. This was a controversial book because it claimed that the stagnation of the poorest that we saw in American society was persisted not in spite of wealth redistribution programs, but because of them. Now, this is, of course, the opposite of what people would be led to expect, that how could it be that these programs that were designed by wonderful people who just want to help could actually have the opposite of their intended effect? How could that be? And Murray, I think, makes an extremely persuasive case. And there has been a lot of nitpicking at Murray's argument, and every misplaced semicolon has been gone over three times. But I think the fundamentals of his argument are quite sound. Now, there's nothing specifically Austrian about what, what Murray is saying, although it, it does conform very well, I, I think, to the basic framework of, of Austrian economics. And if you were an Austrian economist, you would more or less expect precisely these results. So... If you look at the statistics, you look at, say, go from about 1950 to round about 1968, you see there's about, on average, a percentage point decline in the poverty level every year, the poverty rate every year. And then, starting in 1968, it starts to stagnate. It stays pretty much consistent. So it went from roughly 30% in 1950 to around about 12 or 13 percent in 1968. And it was really only at that time in 1968 and following that a lot of the wealth redistribution programs began to get substantial funding. So although they may have been introduced several years earlier, they weren't really heavily funded until later. And it's right around that time that you start to see this stagnation. Now, of course, um, correlation does not imply causation. But nevertheless, this is an interesting fact that when the wealth redistribution really kicks in, that's when the condition of, of the poorest begins to stagnate. And as I say, it's Murray's argument that this is not coincidence. Well, later this became the conventional wisdom. And so when, when Bill Clinton was interested in uh, ending welfare as we know it, as he put it, this was one of the arguments that was put forth, that these programs are counterproductive and they're contributing to the problem. Now, he didn't really end welfare as we know it because there are 50 zillion other programs other than the one that was basically turned over to the states. But nevertheless, there was something of the Murray thesis at work there. So in order to explain how it is that he could come to such a, uh, to many people, counterintuitive conclusion, I want to start off with a bit of a thought experiment. And this is a thought experiment that Murray himself uses. And I think it's, um, I think it works. I, I think it's a very useful one. And he says, look, what he's trying to do with this thought experiment is show how difficult it actually is to design a wealth redistribution program or a social transfer program that does not, in fact, make the problem in question worse. This is actually a very difficult thing for, for policy people to, to do. So the thought experiment he gives us involves a government program to discourage smoking. And what he's looking to do here is to try to show us how difficult it would be to devise a government program that would, in fact, have the net effect of decreasing the number of smokers. <coughs> well, if we were to design such a program, we would need to, first of all, come up with sufficient inducement to encourage someone to stop smoking. So if we simply said, you know, I'll give you 10 cents to quit smoking, it's not going to work. But likewise, it would be impractical to say, if you quit smoking, I'll give you $10 trillion. Okay, we're not all Ben Bernanke, right? <laughs> so you can't, you can't do that either. So you're going to have to come up with some kind of reasonable middle ground here. And in 1985, Murray proposed the figure of $10,000. We'll give you $10,000 now you, if you stop smoking. Now, you can't have just started smoking yesterday just so you could collect the, the 10 grand. So in order to avoid that sort of outcome, what we'll do is we'll say that you've got to quit smoking and stick with it for a year, and you must have already been smoking at least a pack a day for five years. So again, you can't have somebody who just started five minutes ago and then wants the money. You have to have been smoking a pack a day for five years, and then if you quit and you stay off smoking for a year, we'll give you $10,000. Now, for the sake of argument, we're going to leave out people who quit and then relapse or go back to smoking. We'll just leave that out for the sake of argument. Okay. 
What's going to happen as a result of this are several different scenarios that are more or less going to play out simultaneously. Let's think, first of all, about people who are in their fourth year and 11th month of smoking. Those people are obviously going to smoke for one more month so they can get 10 grand. Like there'd be no reason to quit in four years, 11 months. Think likewise of people who are in their fourth year and 10th month of smoking. Again, you, you smoke for two more months, you get 10 grand. Now, obviously, this sort of incentive becomes dulled and, and less acute as the number of months diminishes. So if, if, let's say, you have been smoking for four years even, okay, you wouldn't have as strong an incentive. But nevertheless, one more year of smoking, you get 10 grand. I mean, I don't think people need to be talked into this. Now, this, again, this is $1985, and this is also before all the cigarette taxes when you'd be paying $10,000 for one more year of smoking. <laughs> yeah, we leave that out. But if you have been smoking for anywhere between zero and five years, you have an incentive to keep on doing it. Now, there's one factor about smoking that is also, I, I think, uh, worth pointing out here is that once you start smoking, it's very difficult to quit. It's much easier to start than it is to stop. So what may have seemed like sufficient inducement before you started, in other words, you may have thought to yourself, Five years from now, 10 grand will easily get me to quit smoking. Well, by the time you start smoking, it may actually be trickier than you thought. Maybe you'll be willing to keep smoking and forego the 10 grand. And of course, what Murray is getting at here is that welfare dependency is the same way. That once you get on it, it's easy to get on it. It's very difficult to get off it. It's easy to get on it because that's the natural inclination of mankind, is to achieve your ends by means of the least possible exertion. And so you're just going with the flow by accepting a transfer payment. But once you get acclimated to this, it becomes much more difficult to avoid this kind of pathology and, and to be able to live as a productive human being. Okay, so um, what about people who have been smoking a half a pack a day for five years? Well, okay, well, they're, they're going to want to start smoking a full pack to qualify for the program. Or what if you've been smoking 19 cigarettes a day? Start smoking 20. If you are a teenager, let's say you're a teenager and you're kind of on the fence about whether to start smoking. You know, you know, all the cool kids seem to be smoking. So you're already inclined to do it. And then you get told in five years you get $10,000, which for a teenager is like an unimaginable sum. $10,000? So in other words, the marginal figure here who, who could go either way, could be a smoker or non-smoker, could find that this inducement is just enough to push him over the edge. <coughs> So what you are faced with is the problem of finding a sufficient, an inducement that's sufficient to get people to stop engaging in the negative behavior, but that is not so great that it encourages other people to begin engaging in the negative behavior. And so, quoting Murray, he says, if 90% of the population had been smoking for five years when the program began, we might still argue that the program would show a net reduction in smoking. But only about 15% of the adult population smokes a pack a day or more. Let us estimate that a third of this number have been smoking at that rate for more than five years. If so, our plan has the potential for reducing smoking among 5% of the adult population and the potential for increasing smoking among 95% of the adult population. It is exceedingly difficult to attach numbers to the considerations we have just reviewed without coming to the conclusion that the program as specified would have the net effect of increasing both the number of cigarettes consumed and the number of smokers. And what Murray is in effect inviting us to do is to try to think up a better program. I mean, you know, you think you're a smarty pants and you can come up with a better wealth transfer program than I've just come up with? Try it. And you'll see that you're coming up against the same constraints and difficulties that we've encountered here. In fact, it, his experience here has led, leads Murray to lay out three laws. And there's no need to memorize them. I mean, these aren't praxeological laws, but they're just based on broad empirical generalizations and from just reasoning about the nature of the problem. And the first of these laws he calls the law of imperfect selection. <clears throat> and he says any objective rule that defines eligibility for a social transfer program will irrationally exclude some persons. So no matter how you define 
the parameters of the program, some people will be irrationally excluded. And what we mean by that, or we can all think, I, I, I suppose, of people who are in terrible straits and they're, they face some awful disaster, and yet somehow, for some fluky reason, they don't qualify for any of the government's programs, whereas some bum qualifies for everything. So, you know, we, we're inclined, you know, we notice this, that this sometimes happens. <clears throat> so there's always going to be this tendency to then broaden the program, to make sure that you hit every conceivable person who, who is, in some sense, at least in a legitimately difficult spot. But the more you broaden it, again, the more you're going to bring in people who could have gotten by without this, but who will then be stuck in it forever. Second is what he calls the law of unintended rewards. And this is really what we've been going over here. He says, any social transfer increases the net value of being in the condition that prompted the transfer. So that is to say, as in our case of smoking, the transfer program, in effect, makes it more valuable for you to be a smoker than to be a non-smoker. So it encourages the very thing it's looking to abolish. So the program that seeks to change behavior has to offer an inducement that unavoidably either adds to the attraction of or reduces the penalties of engaging in the behavior in question. And then finally, what he calls the law of net harm. And he describes this as, he says, the less likely it is that the unwanted behavior will change voluntarily, the more likely it is that a program to induce change will cause net harm. And I'll just elaborate on this a bit from uh, using a passage from the book. <clears throat> he says, um, as inducements become large, as they must if the program is dealing with the most intractable problems, the more attractive they become, the inducements, to people who were not in need of help in the first place. We do not yet know how large they must finally become. We do know from experience, however, that quite generous experimental programs have provided extensive counseling, training, guaranteed jobs, and other supports, and failed. We can only guess at what would be enough, perhaps a matter of years of full-time residential training, followed by guaranteed jobs at double or triple the minimum wage. We do not know. Whatever they are, however, consider their effects on the people not in the program. At this point, it appears that any program that would succeed in helping large numbers of the hardcore unemployed will make hardcore unemployment a highly desirable state to be in. And we say this not to be mean, and, and of course there are a lot of wealth transfers in society that benefit the most privileged, so I don't mean to say this is the only outrage in the system, but nevertheless, for people who say, oh, come on, no one would actually uh, drop out of the labor force and accept these transfer programs just because they exist. You've got a really cynical view of human nature. M my view is you've got to get out more. I mean, seriously, there are people whose behavior has been perhaps permanently warped by this sort of thing. They, they, they cannot behave any longer in a non-infantile way as a result of these programs. Now, it's interesting, they actually, have, they actually did a study from the late 60s to the late 70s um, called the the Seattle Income Maintenance Experiment and the Denver Income Maintenance Experiment. So, Syme, Dime. And then they did uh, smaller scale replicas of these studies in several other places, including New Jersey. And what they wanted to, to study, where they had a control group and they had a group that was receiving uh, transfer payments in a, the form of a negative, in, ne negative income tax program. So, one group is getting the transfers and one group isn't. I mean, it's slightly more technical than that. One of them is getting a certain type. One of them is getting a really accentuated type. But the bottom line is that the people who are receiving very generous transfers are, in fact, as it, as it was found, uh, their, their hours worked declined by 43% over the course of the study. I mean, why not drop out of the, of the labor force? And, and, and for people who married during that time, it was 33%. Now, there's a lot of question about does welfare undermine the family? Well, in this study, they found that families getting these transfer programs, uh, we found, uh, they found in these studies that white families in the Syme-Dime experiments, uh, their 
marriages broke up uh, 30, 36% more often than in the control, in the control group. And for black families, the figure was 42%. Uh, in the New Jersey site, when they did a replica of this program, uh, black families receiving the transfers, they had a 66% higher family breakup rate. Spanish-speaking families had an 84% higher family breakup rate. But in one experiment, in Gary, no effect was observed at all in marriages. So researchers went to Gary to try to find out what could be accounting for this. Why in this one place were marriages not breaking up in the wake of this, this program? And the answer was that couples were under the impression that they would lose the money if they ended their marriage. So they stayed together. Interesting. So as, as, as uh, Murray puts it, the only time we have been able to put the question to a controlled test, the causal effect was unambiguous and strong. All right, now I've got here a few titles that I... Uh, oh, wait, no, okay, what's the trick here? I don't have my glasses on. What's the trick? How do I get this up? Thanks. It is. I'm used to the old-fashioned kind of uh, overhead projector. This is the, this is the super-duper kind. Okay, so for these top four are titles I recommend. Uh, there's the Murray book I've been talking about. Uh, and I don't, by the way, needless to say, this doesn't mean I endorse every single thing Charles Murray does. I mean, I think he's actually kind of a softie on the welfare state in some areas. I mean, he's not, he doesn't want to get rid of everything. But he, by and large, if you get him on a good day, he wants to get rid of enough of it that you can say, okay. Uh, particularly because I think this book is a genuine contribution. Myron Magnet, again, kind of neo -conny, But on this issue, I, I think his dream and the nightmare has got some good information on the subject. James Payne's kind of a boring book, but it's... It's, again, it's got a lot of very suggestive evidence and statistics if you're interested in this subject. Now, this, this final book on, on this topic, The Unraveling of America, is written, it seems to me, from the point of view of a mainstream or even left liberal historian, but just looking through the Great Society programs in the 1960s and critically assessing them. And he came to the conclusion that really none of them worked. Uh, they all seem to have uh, made problems worse. And he even looks at the medical programs, Medicare and Medicaid, and he finds that by and large there's no particular increase in the amount of medical care people are receiving. What instead we have is a wealth transfer from uh, middle class Americans to middle class health professionals. But otherwise, the, the care seems to be about the same, as I say, in terms of, of quantity and number of doctor visits per year and so on. So those are, those are things we want to get started. There are a million other titles. Um, one might cite. Now, in my own, some of my own work, like for example, in uh, Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, I've got a lot of statistics on this general subject. And you know, one thing one could talk about is you could talk about the, the issue of poverty and how you define it and the, what should be obvious point that by any historical standards or standards of, uh, you know, comparatively looking at the rest of the world, obviously people who are living in the U.S., even who are poor, are living at a material level that is much higher than that of pretty much anyone who ever lived. And that's not to say that they're not living in difficult situations or that I would like to move into their houses or anything, but just understanding that we don't live in a, in, in a utopia where all goods are super abundant. I mean, we, we're not even close to that. So we need to recognize that we have, in fact, uh, a, a, a situation in which if you care genuinely about the material condition of the poorest people, and you want to find out what, in what societies are these people doing the best, in what, in what societies are these people's material condition the highest, it's always the market societies all, all over the world. And there's, and there's, a, there's tremendous work been done on this. But I don't want to dwell on that issue because there's, I think there's been a lot done on that. But you can, you can look at all the statistics comparing the American poor to the European middle class and, and, and draw, some, draw some conclusions. Um, education and Medicare, I, I think I'll... Forego, but there was a study done about five years ago that looked at the major transfer programs like Social Security and Medicare. And of course, we all know as we hear it, at least in the circles we travel in, we hear a lot about the coming financial meltdown associated with, with those programs because there obviously isn't going to be anywhere near the money necessary to fund them at their promised levels. Well, the study that was done about five years ago by Chris Edwards and Tad DeHaven found that the average 65-year-old man can expect to receive somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of $71,000 more 
in benefits from these, mostly from these major transfer programs than he paid in. Whereas the average 25 year old man can expect to pay in over the course of his lifetime somewhere on the order of $322,000 more than he will get back. So that uh, seems to be kind of a problem, I, I think. <laughs> you want to look at the morality of the situation. Now, looking through the so-called Great Society programs, these are the programs that are put into effect by Lyndon Johnson uh, during the, uh, the 1960s. And as I said, you know, Medicare is one of them. <coughs> Social Security, of course, isn't. That's from the 30s. But one of the programs, just a typical example, is the uh, the Job Corps. And this is the, this is going to help the hardcore unemployed, people living in the slums. We're going to get them out of that depressing environment, and we're going to move them to abandoned military bases because that just has the word cheery written all over. It. <laughs> and we're going to train and and recruit them for uh, some productive niche in the workforce. So. Starting in 1965, they're going to take 100,000 people and, and do this. Well, in the first year, uh, the main issue connected with the Job Corps was the crime problem in the Job Corps. So you've got problems of uh, burglary and window smashing. Um, you've got people being stabbed. Um, a, there was a food riot that federal marshals had to put down. I mean, this was not quite working out um, there was one incident that, uh, since we have young young ears in the room, I, I, I won't recount, but um, let's just say a lot of terrible things happened. Well, let's suppose you, you know, let's look at the people, though, who didn't get stabbed or in, in other ways coerced. Um, what, what, was the, uh, what was the outcome of the program? Well, one thing they found early on was that people who completed the program had no better success in the job market than no-shows, that is, people who had been accepted into the program and never showed up. So you don't even bother showing up. You do exactly the same in terms of success in the job market. It, it cost, and this has stayed about constant over the years, it cost about as much to put one person through this program for a year as it would to have sent the person to Harvard. And there's no, there are no results. I mean, zero, zippo, nothing. We also have the problem that throughout the, the, uh, the first decade of the program, two-thirds of the participants did not bother to finish it. So let that sink in a little bit. We're giving you a free job training program, and you don't even finish it? So we've got two-thirds of, you know. So, you know, am I committing a hate crime if I, if I suggest that maybe we're starting to figure out why some of these people are having trouble finding work? We give you a free job training program and you won't even go to that? I mean, come on now, right? Well, they, a private accounting firm did an audit of the Job Corps in the early 1990s. And they found that 12% of people leaving Job Corps programs found work in the field for which they had been trained. 44% found a job at all. A total of 44% found any job whatsoever. The average hourly wage was slightly above the minimum wage. That was what the program had to show for itself. And then when Bill Clinton said that he was going to end welfare as we know it, he increased the Job Corps budget, though. And so and there are districts all over the, uh, the country in which congressmen will boast of all the money they got for the Job Corps, relying on the ignorance of the general public about what a feckless program this is. So that... And, and I, honest, honest to goodness, and don't laugh at them, but I, I would tell this to American history students back when I taught in New York. And honestly, I would get people saying, well, then why does this program continue if it doesn't work? I said, don't, don't laugh. Because, <laughs> I mean, that is, that's the first, you know, wonder is the beginning of philosophy. You know, the, is the, you know, right? I mean, it's the first step, right? They're asking, why would it persist? Well, you know, wealth transfers, vote buying, whatever. This is, uh, this is how the thing works, and they, they don't abolish things that, that fail. In fact, I, I was talking to Mark Thornton once, and he, he had just come across some data. Because, of course, the individual states sometimes will have their own job training programs. And I think he was talking about Alabama. He was arguing that uh, it, the last time they studied it, they found that over the previous year of the program, 
Not one person in Alabama who went through this program got a job in the field of the program trained him for. Not even one. But we get told all the time, but we need job training. How can people possibly find jobs if we don't give them job training? I don't know. It seems like the other way around, almost. <laughs> and, and also that the private sector knows how to, you know, whatever they need, they'll train you for. Or, um, you know, go to one of these, uh, you know, sort of um, university, little two-year universities that train you for a practical uh, skill, it seems to me. But we're not allowed to say these things for some reason. I don't know why. It seems like it would be helpful to say them. Well, then, oh, my gosh, look at the time. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. I still have that. I thought, I thought it ended at uh, 11. It ends at 11.15. All right. I thought, man, I've been going on way too long on these poor people, right? This is terrible. Well, combine this with the fact that in the late 60s, you start getting a kind of philosophical rationale for this. It's not just, uh, hey, we should help the poor. It's, no, the poor have a right to a share of the common wealth. That was the way it was put. So, <coughs> I'll elaborate on that in a minute, but I first want to look at what the consequences of that form of thinking are, that you are entitled to that. You shouldn't feel ashamed. You shouldn't hide your head when you go in the welfare office. You, could, you should walk in there with your head held high. This type of thing was rammed through people's heads. And again, quoting Charles Murray, he says that one thing that people did earn when they would work in these difficult, low-paying jobs, even if they didn't earn a high salary, they earned something intangible that he called status rewards, that at least people in your neighborhood would respect you, that at least you're an honorable person. You are not expected. You're not expecting other people to take care of you. You're holding you're carrying your own weight. But if suddenly you're being told, well, that's, you know, why you don't have to do anything and we'll we'll give you stuff that you have a right to. Well, what type of effect does this have on the thinking, particularly of the rising generation? So here's Murray. He says, One of these high, once these highly functional sources of status are removed, the vaunted work ethic becomes highly vulnerable. The notion that there is an intrinsic good in working, even if one does not have to, may have impressive philosophical credentials, but on its face it is not very plausible, at least not to a young person whose values are still being formed. To someone who is not yet persuaded of the satisfactions of making one's own way, there is something laughable about a person who doggedly keeps working at a lousy job for no tangible reason at all. And when working no longer provides either income or status, the last reason for working has truly vanished. The man who keeps working is, in fact, a chump. Fred Siegel has written a lot about this, S-I-E-G-E-L. And Siegel says, because... because uh, a lot of people have tried to argue that the explosion in welfare and welfare caseloads, uh, which occurred in the late 60s, was the result just of a lack of jobs, not because of the incentive structure that pulled people into it. There's just a lack of jobs. Well, Siegel says, talk to intelligent urbanites in New York, Los Angeles, or Washington about welfare, and almost the first thing they'll tell you is that people are on welfare because of an absence of jobs. When you point out that the welfare explosion in America – not only began in New York, but also coincided with the great economic and jobs boom of the 1960s, when black unemployment in the city was running at 4%, about half the national average for minorities, they look puzzled and tend to change the subject. Well, no wonder they'd rather change the subject. If you look at New York City, which was very uh, liberal in its welfare policy in the 60s, the number of people on welfare in New York City grew between 1945 and 1960, by 47,000. But between 1960 and 1965, so just a five-year period, it grew by more than 200,000. And then during one of the most prosperous periods in American history, it got worse still. By 1971, there were more than 1.1 million people on welfare in New York City alone which happens to be more than the populations, the entire populations of 15 states. Jobs were also widely available in the prosperous 1980s and 1990s. The poverty rate continued to stagnate. Jobs that required only basic secretarial skills were going unfilled for just lack of qualified applicants. There were other good-paying jobs that could not find qualified applicants that required simply that the applicant understand what 75% means or that 
required the applicant to be able to divide 100 by 4. Now, this is, remember, they've all gotten 12 years of, of free education, right? Government supplied education. 12 years of it. And if you're still having trouble dividing 100 by 4, you know, what, what can we really say about this situation? Or, I mean, c- couldn't a grown person just go to the library and take out a book on how to divide 100 by 4? Like, I mean, are people, are we supposed to believe people are that pathetic and helpless? I mean, like, why would you be so insulting toward people that you would, you'd think this way? But anyway, in fact, I remember this is a, this is a, uh, tangent, but I was on a panel back at my old college, uh, and I had tenure at the time, thankfully. And, and I, we were talking about, we were talking about a, the subject of affirmative action came up. And people were arguing, well, you know, the reason some people do better than others on standardized tests is that they can afford to take the test, the, the, uh, the test taking classes, which I never did. I thought, what kind of a, you know, I don't have time for that. I, I have geeky books to read. I don't have time for this. And, and so people were saying that, you know, it's just a matter of privilege. And somebody in the audience said, well, what would stop you from going to your local library and just checking out a book on test preparation? Dead silence. No one knows how to answer this. Anyway, um, this idea, though, that welfare, uh, that wealth transfers were a right, uh, this, as I say, became prevalent in the 1960s. The New York Times, for example, began to speak of a new philosophy of social welfare that seeks to establish the status of welfare benefits as rights based on the notion that everyone is entitled to what I said before, a share of the common wealth. Um, something called the National Welfare Rights Organization was founded in 1966. It got government money through the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And it was the, the idea was that it would be a bargaining agent for the poor to demand more and more wealth transfers from, from other people. It spent that money propagandizing among the poor to go out and demand what was rightfully theirs. And they did various, they engaged in various guerrilla tactics to effect, make it, in effect, make it impossible for caseworkers to engage in their work because they would, they'd go in and each one would take up five to eight hours of time. And it's just, so eventually they just decided, all right, we just approve everybody. We just give up. They just overwhelm the system. And so we have what we have now. We still have uh, the same persistent level. Okay. Well, maybe these sorts of things would work though internationally, right? They didn't work here, but maybe if one country just gives money to another, or I should be more precise, one government gives money to another government. Maybe this will lift people up. And this was the conventional wisdom after World War II, that if you are going to have any success whatsoever in lifting the less developed countries into developed status, this can happen only through wealth transfers. And one of the reasons for this, by the way, and we'll talk about how it was answered later, but one of the stated rationales was that these countries were locked in what was called a vicious circle, not not vicious cycle, the vicious circle of poverty. The vicious circle of poverty consisted of the fact that, of course, we all know that if you want to grow in wealth, you need to have, you want to have capital accumulation. And then you can, therefore, produce in greater and greater abundance over time and people's needs are satisfied more readily. Well, of course, first you need adequate savings to make the capital investment possible. But the argument was these countries were so poor they couldn't spare any money for saving. So they couldn't get the capital investment. So they persisted in being very, very, uh, undercapitalized sort of countries, which in turn made them poor. And because they were poor, they didn't have the money for investment and it just continued in a circle. And the only way to break out of this circle would be by an outside infusion of funds. So you can see there is a superficial plausibility to this. It's not completely absurd. It's a superficial plausibility to it. So this was the conventional wisdom after World War II, and also because of the perceived success of the Marshall Plan, of course, which was for European economic recovery and was eventually employed for uh, Western Europe, although it was at least in theory available to everybody. And people believed that that had been responsible for bringing about the economic recovery. Because after all, you had a devastated Europe, then you had the Marshall Plan, then you had economic recovery. So again, you know, obviously we see what, what uh, caused what. So here I, I refer you to the bottom item here, an article by Tyler Cowen. You can just Google it. And I think he's actually got it on his own website in PDF form. It's called The Marshall Plan, Myths and Realities. This is a great essay. And uh, 
It doesn't quite excuse all the heresies and deviations of Tyler Cowen, but all the same, it is certainly a, a point heavily in his favor because he, he makes the argument that, in fact, this is uh, the praise that's been heaped on the Marshall Plan is entirely misplaced. There doesn't seem to be any correlation between how much Marshall aid you get and how quickly you recovered. In fact, a lot of places recovered before they really got any Marshall aid and other places like Britain got a ton of it and they stagnated. So uh, that and many other reasons seem to suggest that the Marshall Plan is not all it was cracked up to be. And of course, the Marshall Plan was really a, I mean, e even in those, you know, by the dollar standard of those days, 13 billion is a tiny drop in the bucket compared to the size of these economies. But it's been suggested that what Africa needed was a Marshall Plan, something of that magnitude. Well, they've received about six over, over the years. They've received about six Marshall Plans. And the results have been not very good. Well, by the 1990s, people began to acknowledge that something had gone wrong. Some of them didn't necessarily know why they'd gone wrong yet. But something had gone wrong. So the World Bank even acknowledged in 1997 that what happened with foreign aid was that governments embarked on fanciful schemes Private investors lacking confidence in public policies or the steadfastness of leaders held back. Powerful rulers acted arbitrarily. Corruption became endemic. Development faltered and poverty endured. Well, I don't know why they'd be surprised that the money would have been used in an arbitrary way. That's Governments have to use money in an arbitrary way. There's no way for them to do any, anything else, as we've seen this week. Uh, we look over the past decade or so in Egypt... The percentage of people in extreme poverty in Egypt has remained unchanged in spite of billions of dollars in aid. Um, we can go on many African examples. Peter Boone did some interesting studies compiling data for 97 countries that had received aid over a 20-year period. He found no significant correlation between aid and poverty reduction. And so, in other words, I, I'm playing this on the foreign aid people's own terms, like, because these are the terms on which they would evaluate the programs. So we're looking at them, and, and we don't see it. He found nothing to indicate that aid increased life expectancy figures or primary school enrollment in the countries receiving it. It seems very likely that foreign aid has slowed the process of economic reform. Why bother reforming if, you're gonna, if, you're, if your stupidity is going to continue to be subsidized? If your policies that enrich the ruling class and impoverish the rest of society, uh, you know, you're enjoying those policies, and that's going to be subsidized, why discontinue them? It makes no sense. So even, even the World Bank, again, said reform is more likely to be preceded by a decline in aid than by an increase in aid. Well, no kidding, because then it forces, forces these countries to get serious. That happened in the cases of South Korea, Taiwan, and Chile, for example. They finally engaged in serious reform, free, genuine free market reform, when they had no other choice. And then they, you know, they, they did pretty well. I mean, I wouldn't mind living in any of those countries. So, and also, by the way, even basic humanitarian assistance has often wrought havoc. And it's not to say that individuals shouldn't help individuals, but I often think that this is uh, best undertaken by people with a knowledge of local conditions, whether it's, uh, you know, monastic orders or, you know, f f friars or uh, the Red Cross or whatever that have some sense of, of, of what's going on. I, I, another tangent, by the way, in parentheses, one of my favorite little anecdotes in Murray Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression, is that during the Depression, the Red, or in the early years of the Depression, the Red Cross was going to get a $25 million government grant, and they turned it down on the grounds that, you know, no, we need to encourage independence and freedom, and we can't become, you know, just get on the government dole. But yeah, well, can't have that, I guess. Well, anyway, so if you look at what's happened, typically, is that there'll be some disaster, and what will happen is the global governing authorities we're privileged to have will be too slow to actually prevent many deaths, but just in time to totally undercut local industries trying to cope with it. So local farmers will finally be getting their act together, and then suddenly a whole bunch of food will be dumped on the market at a price of zero. Now, arguably, you could say, yeah, but on the other hand, they should just sit back and accept the, the zero price thing in the same way that if Japan were dumping zero price televisions on us, the best thing to do would be just be to accept the televisions and go with it. But, of course, this isn't going to be done in a sustained way. It's done in a totally haphazard, unpredictable way. And so it, again, makes it very difficult on, on these countries. I remember seeing an ad for the Acton Institute in which they were quoting uh, an African archbishop who kept saying, please stop sending us your old clothes. 
Okay, because you're you're making it very hard for us to start producing clothes, which we really need to start doing. Let's face it over here, right? So please don't do that. You're just you're just interfering in this. Yes. Yeah, right, right. But you're not. The point is that you're not going to be given it on a sustained basis. I mean, you'll be given it. You know, every 10 years when rock musicians get together and write a special song for you, but then that goes away. And then, you know, so, so if it were sustained, if, yeah, or if let's say Martians were bringing us clothes, then I would say, of course, we should abandon. Who cares about the clothing manufacturers? Stinks for them. You know, uh, enjoy the abundance that the aliens are bringing uh, with the rest of us. Um, let me just see if I can just get through because I, I, I'm running out of time. Um, I'll try and leave a couple minutes for questions at, at, at the end. So, um, all, all right. So, anyway, let's, uh, let's let's carry on with this. Um, there's also the corruption question. I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to get hung up on corruption because I feel like the whole system's corrupt. Like, I mean, if some guy takes a bribe, this is hardly, you know, a, a, a huge deal. But nevertheless, there there was a study done in in 2002 in the American Economic Review, uh, in, in, and looking at whether there was some type of correlation between aid and corruption. And they somehow came up with some series of criteria to determine, you know, the most corrupt regimes in the world. I mean, that, that'd be an interesting thing. W which are the worst of the, of the worst? And they, they came up with about the 20 worst dictators in power. And they found the U.S. government had funded 19 of them. <laughs> so, and I guess the 20th, I don't know, they just never got around to it or something. But they, they, they came to the conclusion that there, there seems to be, you know, this doesn't seem to be a coincidence. There seems to be something in, in the logic of it. And it same, it came, it's come to the point that African government officials ha have become so known for their attachment to fancy automobiles that there's now a word in Swahili, the word wabenzi, refers to men of the Mercedes Benz. They actually had to coin this word to refer to their elites in this way. Okay, so at this point, though, by the time we get to the 1990s, even the New York Times, which admits nothing, admits that, well, you know, this, none of these programs seem to have worked, but, you know, no one could have known, right? Who could, you know, we all had the best of intentions. Nobody could possibly have known that this was going to happen. Well, somebody did know, and I put him up here, too, Peter Bauer. And I, I, I chose this book, not, I wouldn't say arbitrarily, but in the sense that Bauer has so many books that are worth reading. I, I put From Subsistence to Exchange and other essays. That's from the year 2000, Princeton University Press. But almost anything you read by Bauer is extremely valuable. And he was a lonely voice for, for years, arguing that these programs would have exactly this result because he argued that, first of all, what you need in these developing countries is the, is the, right, culture, are the right cultural attitudes toward entrepreneurship and uh, the free market, and, and money can't give you that. Uh, the money will encourage... Even if you gave the money to the best conceivable regimes, the money itself distorts the economy because it makes it marginally more attractive for you to discontinue your efforts at satisfying consumer wants and instead think of ways you can grab onto the aid money. And in fact, we've seen at least a dozen countries where violent ethnic and racial hatreds have manifested, manifested themselves as these various competing groups all try to grab hold of a share of the grant money. Bauer argued, and by the way, Bauer was finally recognized in the 1980s. Uh, he was made Lord Peter Bauer, and uh, then he won a $500,000 um, scholarly prize, and then I think he died the next year. So the poor guy goes through his whole life being, you know, everybody spits on him, although he was teaching at London and Cambridge, so I mean, it can't be too bad, but you know, gets no recognition. He's a crank. He's a, he finally gets the recognition and then he drops dead. I mean, but so at least read the guy's books. You know, you gotta, gotta do him that. Well, he argued against this vicious circle of poverty argument too, because he said, for one thing, he said, just one of the problems with the vicious circle of poverty argument would be that if this were true, then no country could ever have developed. If every country needs outside infusions of, of uh, funds, then how did the first one develop? Was there an outside, was the same, were the same Martians who brought us the free clothing, were they bringing free capital to these countries? I mean, what, then how did they ever develop? We should all, according to Bauer, and these, this is his exact argument, we should all still be in the Stone Age if the vicious circle of poverty argument were correct. And he said, secondly, and now I'm quoting him, there is not a single instance in history 
when external donations were required for the economic development of a country. He said economic prosperity depends on people's attributes, attitudes, motivations, mores, and political arrangements. If the conditions for development other than capital are present, the capital required will either be generated locally or be co available commercially from abroad to governments or to businesses. If the required conditions are not present, then aid will be ineffective and wasted. All right, so that's a little bit about Bauer, whom I like and, and deeply admire. Now, by the time we get to the 21st century, though, after all of Bauer's work and everybody, by the time you get to the 1990s, everybody's pretending we already knew this. You know, we, we all knew that. Okay, you have to remind them, but then why were you calling for these programs years earlier? They're all claiming that this was, we, we all knew it. But now suddenly, all these arguments are coming back. The vicious circle of poverty argument is back. We need infusions of aid, all this stuff. Now, if you look at the actual, you know, if you look at reality, you look at a place like Hong Kong, for example, you would think, well, this is a place that obviously needs some outside infusions. They, 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 they don't have, uh, you know, they, if you look at all the things you would think you would need, energy supplies, water, you know, whatever, they, they have very, very little of it. I mean, it would seem like this is a place that's got to get some aid, you know, whereas if you look at the African countries, they got all these mineral deposits, they got all, you know, they would, you'd think they, they wouldn't need it. Well, it looks at, it turns out that, of course, Hong Kong, uh, after it is weaned off the aid, uh, Hong Kong adopts a free market, relatively low taxes. I mean, of course, they could be better. But they ended up developing such a robust market economy that by the 1980s, the UK and the US began asking Hong Kong to voluntarily limit the amount of quality products it exported because there's no way the US and UK could compete with them. Well, what about the vicious circle of poverty, right? Shouldn't, shouldn't there still be Stone Age conditions in Hong Kong? Like, why, why? I mean, why would this occur after the aid is discontinued? So we've got that, but nevertheless, this, this idea that we were right all along, we do need this aid, is becoming uh, very widespread. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, for example, is, is, is uh, putting this forth. Uh, Bono from U2, uh, to his everlasting shame, is putting this forth. Um, and so I've, I've put up here a guy named William Easterly, and I've listed two of his books. And believe me, there are many sources on this subject. The White Man's Burden is his more recent book. Um, and Easterly, who had direct contact with these programs, he worked for uh, various global agencies and came to the conclusion that the programs are the problem. They are making things worse. They are entrenching these regimes in power. They are delaying reforms and all the rest of it. But we were told that, no, 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 look, this time we're going to give them the money and tell them to use the money for public investment. Public investment is what we need. Well, if you look at the track record of public investment, like infrastructure, or whatever, you look at, well, what, what is, what happened in the wake of this? Uh, Easterly says over 1970 to, to, ni to from the years 1970 to 1994, there is good data on public investment for 22 African countries. These countries' governments spent $342 billion on so-called public investment. The donors gave these same countries' governments $187 billion in aid over these, over this period. And there was supposed to be a giant step increase in productivity that would result from this. Well, Easterly studied it and found that in terms of per capita growth over this period, the step increase was zero. Nothing. So what they're calling today, uh, this, this way of thinking today is the new economics of foreign aid that says that today we've learned the lessons of the past and so we still want to have foreign aid. We haven't learned that lesson. That we want. But uh, this time we're going to make sure that the best regimes get it. The least predatory regimes get it. So we're not going to send it to that country whose president eats people. We'll send it to the other countries, and then that then they'll 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 do better. Well, um, the, it doesn't seem like the data supports this contention. Uh, the IMF, and again, I like to quote these studies because you wouldn't think they would be prejudiced in a free market direction. Uh, IMF study said there is no evidence that aid works better in better policy or geographical environments. And they said that no subcategories of aid have any significant impact on growth. But this is the conventional wisdom now in the United States as well, and it became that under George W. Bush. He established a, a program that was going to institutionalize the new economics of foreign aid, which, as we've seen, is really nothing that new about it. 
and as because it's more or less what they've been doing, except with this supposedly new criterion that we're just going to send it to good people this time. Well, they've been telling us this forever. John F. Kennedy said in 1963, objective number one, to apply stricter standards of selectivity in aiding developing countries. Six years later, the Pearson Commission said the same thing. In 1985, the Kasson Development Committee Task Force on Foreign Aid said that the relief of poverty depends both on aid and on the polities of the recipient countries. Okay, had no effect on any decision that was made after that. Uh, in 1992, we got another government report that said um, even very well-designed projects cannot succeed in a poor policy environment. So we'll just give the aid to super-duper countries. But again, the aid itself is the problem. It's not like it's a good policy gone bad because it gets into the wrong hands. It encourages all the wrong incentives. And even the Marshall Plan, every dollar a recipient government received, they were expected by an equivalent amount to increase spending in the public sector. So you're increasing the state sector, the predatory sector's reach over the economy. This is not a healthy thing. Let me read you, though, something that James Bovard points out, because this is quite amusing to me. Uh, George W. Bush made an announcement that uh, he was going to increase foreign aid uh, in 2002, starting over the next three years, by $5 billion. And he thought he'd get global huzzas for this. Instead, all he heard was crickets, like no response whatsoever. So Bovard says the White House was chagrined when Bush's proposal did not generate massive international applause. So on the day before he left for Mexico, White House officials revealed that there had been a glitch in the original announcement and that Bush actually planned to give away more than twice as much money under the new program. White House spokesman Ari Fleischer said the mistake was simply a result of confusing math. And then, of course, we understand National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice explained, we didn't want to go out there with essentially false or phony numbers. Never. The Bush administration, never. False or phony numbers, never. Well, this is not brain surgery. Uh, if you look at the various countries in the world that are livable, you find that all these economically successful countries have relatively secure property and contract rights, and all the unsuccessful ones don't. So the best thing, it seems to me, that you can do, that you can give to these countries is advice, is a model, is a good example, uh, because everything else has been a complete disaster. So on that note, Mark just signaled to me that I have to stop. So anybody wants to talk, you can come up and... All right, folks, quick announcement. I'm keynoting the convention of the Libertarian Party of Florida, their state convention that is taking place the weekend of May 3rd through the 5th, 2019. And you can get details on that. Uh, there are numerous other speakers you will definitely enjoy hearing from, uh, several of whom have been guests here on The Tom Woods Show. So LPF, Libertarian Party of Florida, lpf.org, is where you can find out about that convention. And if you'd like to attend, I would be delighted to see you there. All right, that's it for today, everybody. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.